Hello guys, welcome to Knowledge India once again. It has been many days and uh, this tutorial is coming after a long time. I realize that. Uh, I hope that uh, going forward I would be I would be able to bring the tutorials at the same pace as I was doing earlier. Thanks to all of you for your continuous support in terms of uh, watching and spreading word about the Knowledge India channel. I hope you have got benefited. So in this particular tutorial, uh, we are quickly going to compare the different databases which are available on AWS. Uh, I have seen that uh, many of the times people do get confused and they do not clearly understand that what is the difference between these different types of databases. Uh, so, and you know, I also had received uh, this query from many of the guys that they wanted a very clear comparison between them. So that's why this quick tutorial first, uh, where I can go ahead and clarify this for all of you. So if you see on, uh, I've tried to list down things for you so that when I explain you, you can also relate it and read it along with me. So first one is Amazon RDS, which is a relational database service, as the name says, relational database. This particular solution or this particular database service works fine for OLTP systems. OLTP is online transactional processing. In simple terms, if you look at uh, movie ticket booking, right? you go ahead or go to the website and you try to book some ticket, uh, there would be some database where all your all the user details are stored. There would be some data, you know, there, will, there is a database required where you have all the details of the, you know, like cinema hall, what movies are running and show timings and things like that. So all of such things, need to get stored in a relational database. So typical example uh, for this thing is like Oracle, SQL Server. So RDS gives you all that flavor, right? Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and all of that. So that's your OLTP systems. Um, typically, if you, uh, the key thing to understand is if you try to look at those solutions or those applications, you will see that the type of record entry which is happening would be like per record basis. So like, if let's say I'm, you know, consider example that you are buying something um, at a at a grocery shop or some superstore. So when when we are buying and billing is happening, one one record of the items which we are buying is getting inserted into some table, right? So basically, record wise entry, update or delete happens. It sometimes it can happen in batch as well, but the idea is mostly it is all gonna be record or role level operations. Okay. Um, in terms of RDS, the scope of this particular service is region. So you go I mean, like whichever region you like in that particular region, you can go ahead and create your RDS instance. While you're creating RDS instance, you have option to choose between single AZ or multi AZ. If you choose single AZ, basically one instance gets created, which and hence it would be living in one availability zone and it might, it would be prone, uh, you know, for failure in case that particular AZ goes down or something happens to that particular instance, your application would get affected. That's why for production scenarios, it is recommended that you go ahead and use multi AZ RDS instances. So in case of multi AZ, you will have two instances running in two different availability zones in that particular region. I have a, a tutorial already where you can go ahead and see that how to launch a multi AZ RDS instance. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, you also have an option of a read replica. Now read replica is like, um, re you can think of read replica as just another database instance, but as the name says read replica, it only supports read operations, which means from the master, from the actual database, all the data would get replicated to this read replica. And as part of your application, you might be having, you know, certain certain parts of your application which are only doing read operations. Typically, if you see, uh, let's say you have a, you know, the superstore example, if you take in the superstore while sales is happening, you might also be interested that uh, every hour or let's say every five, six hours, you want to look at the report of the sales, right? So you need not hit your actual database in order to pull those reports. Rather, you can go ahead and do that type of reporting activity from this read replica and hence reducing the overall load or overall um, you know, burden which is there on your master database. So you can go ahead and create read replica. Typically, read replica would be there in the same region where your master database is. 
but uh, for some of the uh, databases in RDS, for some of the engines in RDS, I should say, cross region read replica is also available. Typically, Aurora, MySQL, and they're extending it to other things as well. So, which means you can have your master database running in North Virginia, and you can have very well have a read replica running in North California in case the whole let's say it doesn't happen but let's say the whole north virginia goes down you can very well go ahead and just you know turn your north california read replica into master and you know point your application to that particular thing now of course because things are spread across there would be delay in terms of the replication but still this is a very good option okay moving forward snapshots uh, you know as you have you might be knowing that you, you can Go ahead and have manual and automatic both types of snapshots. Snapshots are always stored in S3. They are incremental in nature, and hence, you know, the overall cost, the overall cost uh, for the for multiple snapshots which you are storing, the overall cost would be lesser because it is only it is incremental, and hence only the blocks which have changed from the last snapshot, you know, like suppose you took a snapshot yesterday and then you are taking today, all the blocks would not be captured. Rather, only the changed blocks would be captured. That's why it is good. Uh, RDS lives inside a VPC, and hence all those things, rules of subnets, security groups apply to it. In terms of security of the RDS, the way you connect to RDS uh, instance and then you extract data or basically read the data or write the data, the security for that is DB level. So like, let's say if you have Oracle RDS or you have SQL Server RDS, the way you would authenticate yourself with the RDS system would be, or with the RDS instance would be using an RDS or DB level user, you would connect to it, right? Those of you who have used Oracle, you would know Scott Tiger, right? Which is a DB level user. Similar to that, you'll have DB level user with which you connect to it, and then you do, you know, your insert, update, delete, whatever, based on the permission that user has got. All right, moving on to next is your DynamoDB, okay? Now, DynamoDB is a NoSQL database. Uh, it is a fully managed database. You do not get option to go ahead and manage any of the stuff. All you have to do is just say, at what speed are you gonna read from this database? At what speed do you wanna write from? Do you wanna write to this database? And that's it. All the underlying storage is managed by Amazon. You never have to specify that how much data you wanna store. It is same like, you know, like in terms of management, you can think it same like S3. Don't get confused. I'm, I'm talking about the storage space like as an S3, you don't have to specify that how much data you want to put, right? Same way in DynamoDB, you don't need to specify that how much data are you going to store, okay? So it is a NoSQL database, fully managed, as I said, and the unique thing or the good thing about DynamoDB is that it can give you millisecond, millisecond, uh, single digit millisecond, I should say, single digit millisecond latency with even terabytes of data in a table. So that's why it is good and hence it is used in the scenarios where, where very fast reads are required. Like there are some of the examples if you see the nowadays there are a lot of gaming websites, right? So you would have uh, leaderboards, right? Where the scores are being shown and things like that. Uh, click stream data is, is being captured and few things needs to be shown very quickly, has to be changed very fast. All such things can be stored in DynamoDB. Okay, so that's where it is used. Uh, if, if you are writing a stateless application, right? When I say stateless application, it's basically an application which would be running on n number of instances. You may choose that you will go ahead and keep the session information in the DynamoDB. Really good option. Um, the scope of this is again a region. And while you create a DynamoDB table, you do not choose any availability zone. Why? Because by default, when you put any data, into DynamoDB table, it gets replicated across multiple AZs within that region. Yes, it's not your responsibility. DynamoDB would do it on its own. And that's why data is durable. Anything which you are putting in DynamoDB table would not get lost. Good. So that's the thing. But sometimes people also talk about what if, you know, my, my region itself goes down. Let's say, uh, I have a DynamoDB table in Tokyo and Tokyo region goes down, what do I do then? So DynamoDB also gives you an option of something called streams. Streams can be used in or can be used to basically replicate the data from one DynamoDB table, which is in region one, let's say, 
to another DynamoDB table which is there in region 2. That's how it is, right? So you can use the streams to do that if that's what is your requirement. Uh, uh, typically, you don't need to take any backups, not required because already data is replicated. Also understand that uh, DynamoDB service doesn't live inside a VPC, okay? You just basically go to the region where you want to create the table, go ahead and create the table and start using it. There's no VPC involved here. Though recently, Amazon has extended the use of VPC endpoint for accessing DynamoDB. What does that mean? It means that earlier, if your application had application had to interact with DynamoDB, it was always coming via public network. It was always going that way. Now with the introduction of VPC endpoints, you can go ahead and reach DynamoDB using Amazon's internal private network. I have a detailed tutorial on VPC endpoint which you can check on the channel to understand how the VPC endpoint works and how to even set it up. So please do watch that and learn it if you don't know it already. That's a good one. So it ensures security. It also ensures better bandwidth, right? Between your instance and your DynamoDB. So that's a great thing. Last point related to DynamoDB is in terms of security, you don't have any DB level users. Rather, it is all IM based. So DynamoDB exposes functions or actions basically, which would help you to put you know, to insert data, to select the data, to delete things and everything. There are multiple functions available and it is IAM based. So basically what you need to do is you need to create an IAM user or an IAM role and you'll be able to attach permissions in the form of policies to this user or role and then you can go ahead and do actions on DynamoDB. I'll try to cover it in more detail when I, you know, I will, I'll, I will be bringing a detailed uh, video on or DynamoDB alone. We'll talk more about it, but understand this is not DB level user. This is rather an IM level user. Great. Last one is our Redshift. Now Redshift has has been uh, phenomenal in terms of the change which it has brought into the industry. Earlier, this uh, you know other counterparts or let's say other competitors of Redshift are are actually very costly. So things like Teradata, Netiza, which are actually used in the in the data warehousing world they are all very costly products compared to that redshift gives a very very cheaper and effective solution to to the industry so that they can go ahead and put a lot of their data in a managed manner kind of you know up to a good amount managed manner i would say and they can go ahead and query and get really good performance so this redshift is used for olap systems olap is analytical processing online um, analytical processing and uh, the idea here is uh, like when you have a lot of system where let's say where sales is happening you bring that data and then you want to develop lot, or, you know generate a lot of reports by combining the data from coming from different systems so uh, that is where OLAP systems come in picture right so uh, uh, one of the good things why Redshift stands out is, is that it is a columnar database so the, the, the way it works internally is that it stores all the values of a column next to each other. So if you, if, if those of you who have looked at the queries which are typically used in data warehousing world, you would see that there would be a lot of things like select count of a particular column, select sum of a particular column. So typically the selects are going to be on, on columns. Uh, and then there will, of course, there would be where clause and all of such things, right? Uh, you you do not select a, a row, rather you would try to select all the columns across all the rows, right? Like you will try to select one column, I'm sorry, across all the rows. So that's why the columnar storage helps you a lot. And it is a columnar one. Uh, quickly, uh, again, you go to a region and uh, basically launch the service while you are uh, running a redshift cluster while you're creating a redshift cluster you will be able to choose whether you where do you want to where do you want to keep all its nodes now you can go ahead and keep it in one az or you can spread it across multiple az's but but understand this is not like rds multi az um, there there won't be you no know, replication happening between one node and the other node by default and if one node goes away you know other node will 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 start replying for it it doesn't work that way so typically what people do is people try to keep all the nodes in one az itself 
right? Uh, backups work in the same way, are incremental and stored in S3. Uh, I told you it's columnar database. It lives inside VPC, hence all the things like subnet, security groups apply in the same manner. In terms of security or connecting to the Redshift, same like RDS, you will have DB level user and uh, based on the permission which you have given to that particular DB level user, that guy would be able to do the stuff, whether he can access a table or he can not access a table, delete, create things, all of such things you can control. So uh, uh, that's how this whole thing is. I hope uh, uh, this particular video would have given you an idea about all the three different databases. Uh, I already have a detailed tutorial on RDS, which you can go ahead and look at. Uh, about DynamoDB and Redshift, I'll be bringing more tutorials, which would be uh, more detailed, and we will try to talk a lot more about it. Um, I'm actually working on a, you know, on a on a series of tutorials for Redshift. Now, uh, before I end this, I request you to please share this with your friends if you have liked it and if you if you have understood stuff. In case uh, there is any doubt, I highly recommend you please try to read it a bit. And also, you can go ahead and write it in the comment section. If you have watched it and you are able to understand, please hit the like button. If you are not subscribed already, you know, you can get benefited by subscribing. You will get to know all the new videos. Okay, with that, I'll end this and I will connect with you once again with a new video. Uh, till then, keep learning. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.